Yeah. So it's been about six years since uh, Mike and I did this a uh, live debate on stage, and we want to do sort of a a slightly more friendly reunion. Yeah. Um, and so the format we're going to do today is each of us is going to have some questions for the other, some of which are nice questions and some of which are slightly unfair questions. Uh, we're going to take turns asking questions, and we're also going to take questions from the audience. So we're going to start with a few that we're asking each other, and then we're going to open up for the floor for a bit and back and forth. Okay? So I believe, uh, Mike, you have the honor of the first yeah. shot. Yes. So, uh, John, you have been on record uh, multiple times as saying what we, as in Game Juicer researchers, do is not science. Uh, I would like you to defend that indefensible position. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, I would say that what we're doing is science-ish, okay, or s maybe science light okay. is the best way to describe it. That most of the time we're not discovering new principles; we're applying existing knowledge to a particular game. When the doctor sees a patient, he's not doing science; it's informed by science. Somebody else did the science to find out how this stuff works, but he's not experimenting on the patient in front of him. Okay, so are you ca are you I guess classifying science as basic science? Like is that? Is that the distinction yeah, you I want mean, to make? We're, we're very applied science. <laughs> okay. So, so we, we are very applied science, but I mean, do we not, I guess, have the ability or like the, the capability of creating new knowledge, right? So we do. I mean, and once in a blue, maybe like 5% of the time we're doing what I would consider to be actual science, actual experiments, discovering new principles. But most of the time we're applying the formula. And that's not a bad thing. That's what the game needs. It doesn't need basic discovery. It needs this boss is just too hard. Okay. And that's what I try to give my games when they need it. I'm not so sure we don't need basic discovery, I okay. guess, uh, or that the 5% number is, is accurate. I guess we'll have to, we'll have to see. Um, I, I, I think, the, I guess the point you're making, I guess I, I understand, I, although I do take, I guess, I asked the question because it's provocative, yep. but also because <laughs> we're, they, the, the notion of trying to, I guess, um, build up respect for game just research as a discipline, I, I think is important as for, especially for a new discipline and so, or a newer discipline. And so I guess having the approach that what we're doing is kind of, you know, denigrated in some fashion, I guess, is why I brought up the question and saying it's, I mean, lots of things aren't science. I mean, it's the same as they sort of the, <laughs> I mean, lots of things aren't art. It's, yeah. I, it yeah. only affects you if you take that as a pejorative statement. Sure. I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, uh, yeah. Okay. So we are we are going to try and like because um, we could go on forever about all these and we have th things we want to hit and we obviously want to hear from you guys and so we'll cut off some of the discussions I guess quickly and you can decide who wins each round I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So the question I want to ask you. So yeah. we both came out of academia yeah. and went into industry and I went into the Microsoft system and so I had a whole bunch of mentors to show me the ropes and show me how to do this and. I know there were a lot of mistakes I didn't make because people told me the basics of how to do the job. Yeah. And you went to Valve all by yourself as the only researcher there and presumably had to discover some of these things the hard way. Yeah. So how did you screw up in your first couple of years at Valve? Uh, <laughs> that, was, that was a long time ago, but uh, it happened a lot. Um, yeah, so I, I, when I got to Valve, I was given the following direction, uh, go and be useful. <laughs> End of sentence. Um, okay, you're a psychologist. You want to work at a game company. Uh, go and be useful. Um, so I, I went into, I guess, my job like not really knowing anything about like the actual like discipline of game design. Like I had notions as a psychologist and saying, hey, here are ways we could apply psychology to game design. But um, it, it was very, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, I had essentially no kind of like expectations or, or framework for like how games were actually made other than kind of like intuitions that ended up being not so great. And so it took me about, I think, two or two and a half years to actually feel like I had gotten to the point where I was contributing and actually like doing things that were worthwhile. Um, I didn't know what people found interesting. Like I had thoughts about like what I find interesting that I would go talk to them. So like that's all I did for like my first few months was go and talk to people and say, hey, what do you find interesting? Like I, here's the thing I think is interesting. Is that interesting to you? Um, but it was more often just asking people what they found interesting. And um, I guess I, I was wrong a lot about the kinds of things they were thinking about. Um, some of them we, we kind of came back to at the end, uh, or, or I guess like later on, but um, thinking about uh, just what actually goes into game design and 
the kinds of constraints that are placed upon game design that you don't actually have in academia, I think was really interesting. Um, I guess w one example is in, in ac academia, you, you kind of, um, when you're doing basic research, actual science, mm -hmm. as the case may be, um, you're kind of designing experiments to avoid confounds. And so like, that was like the approach um, that I had is I want like, the cleanest data possible. And so in game design, it's not the, the opposite, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's orthogonal where you're designing kind of um, with regard to confounds, right? Like we can't do pure experimentation for a variety of reasons. And so that was kind of uh, a rough adjustment, I think. Um, saying, going from, hey, like, this is the best way to do this, to know actually we have these constraints like with time, or we can't put half of our player base in an experimental condition and half in a control condition because they're going to talk to each other and complain about like, the benefit, the perceived benefit the other person is getting. And so that was an adjustment, I think. Um, and then, yeah, just trying to, I, I guess, get on my feet as a user researcher or as a psychologist and say, here are ways I think I could be useful. Um, Valve was always big on, big on playtesting. I didn't need to convince them of the utility of that, but um, it, it is kind of, it was, yeah, I think it was rough for a couple of years, like say, like not really knowing anything and thinking, uh, you know, this is a job I could do and could be useful at, but, um, having just so much information like to, to learn about, you know, like what was actually going on. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, both of my intro questions to John are a little bit more aggressive, but, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> So you have, for those who don't know, John has written a fair number of articles for Forgava Sutra, um, uh, you know, of varying quality levels. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, they're all they're all great. Um, but of the ones you've written, uh, which is the one you regret the most? <laughs> <laughs> I think I don't regret any of the articles in a, as a whole. Okay. I think I regret how naive I was when I wrote the first one. Okay. That. Oh, well, I heard a yeah. From <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to agree with me. Yeah. Back me up here. Um, so I was, when I wrote at the time, I was a grad student, and I wrote this article about how to apply basic principles of behavioral psychology to games. And I sort of wrote it, and it was interesting, and I sort of ran it by a couple people and said, yeah, this is cool. So I put it up online. And it did great things. I mean, it went sort of, well, it passed for viral in the early 2000s. Uh, got me my first job at Microsoft and led to a bunch of good things. However, I was incredibly naive about how I phrased things in that article, and it is really prone to misinterpretation, uh, both sort of in both ways. So one way it gets misinterpreted is that about every six months, the reporter discovers it and writes an article about why games are evil and why I'm evil and how I've corrupted games. Like there, there's literally like entire videos on YouTube about why I'm bad. And second thing is, there are people who look at it and say, you figured out how to manipulate people, that sounds awesome, and try to hire me. And I get one of those, somebody who sort of assumes I'm a sociopath and tries to hire me about every about a month, every, about once a month. And so I wish I had been more careful about my phrasing and more, thought more about how the article, people were going to perceive the article than making the material in it right. Sure. Seems reasonable. Cool. Okay. So I'm going to do one more to you, and then we're going to take a couple from the audience. Uh, so I, one of the things I, I don't know a lot about how user research actually happens at Valve. Yep. But one of the things I do know is that most of the studies are not done by you or the other researcher. Yes. They are run by, the actual participants are coming in, and they're being, in studies, run by designers, engineers, that kind of people. Yep. Is everyone in this room doing it wrong? <laughs> like, are they all unnecessary? Uh, so the, the short answer is no. Of course, everybody in this room is incredibly necessary. And the longer answer is the following. Um, so Valve's, I guess, philosophy about uh, game design and playtesting has always been playtest as early and as often as you can and to have no barriers between the people creating the content and the people consuming the content. Uh, this was the, the case long before I got there um, and yeah, presumably will be the case long after I, mm -hmm. I, I leave. Or, um, the the th so like that was the rationale. Um, obviously, having people who are not trained to to do playtests is is not great. Um, I think uh, going forward, we like my role at Valve. Um, I do some of the some of the studies and I consult on on design and 
um, kind of give feedback and, and kind of coach people. Um, but like I have interest in, in doing other things, and so I work on other things because I because I can. Um, so I could spend all of my time doing like more traditional use research if I wanted, and so could uh, our other psychologist Brian. Um, I think the so the the downside right is that we you know that there are lots of things that could go wrong and could get lots of poor quality data and get lots of data from. Uh, you know, folks who aren't trained to, to acquire it, right? All the skills that, that we have that we, we find so useful. Um, the, the upside, I guess, is that you don't have to convince people of the utility of playtesting. Um, everybody at the company understands the importance, um, that it, it is the most important thing that we do, right? Like you don't need to get buy-in from other aspects, other disciplines, other people at the company. Everybody knows the way we make good games is by putting them in front of somebody who is not us. Um, gathering data from them and then iterating and improving the product, whether it's a product that has not been released or a product that has been released after the fact. Um, you know, so that's a process that has worked for Valve for a while and um, you know, may fall down at some point or maybe has fallen down uh, you know, at various points. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that you know, I think we're not open to the idea of hiring user researchers and you know, please come up and convince me that you know, we should hire you and that's awesome and, and we would and we will. And we actually do have um, uh, a user researcher on like the hardware side who mm -hmm. is running all, doing all that stuff. Um, but yeah, the, the general notion, it's just a, a, it's a philosophy at Valve that kind of came from the notion that we think it's a good idea not to have barriers between you know, the developers and the customer or to move them as much as we could. Like that's what drove the design of Steam and, and, and various things. And so um, it's kind of carried over into the playtesting and you know, even as user research has matured as a discipline, it's just not something that we have, you know, I guess explicitly kind of sought out. But you know, we absolutely could be, you know, sure we are making you know, very many mistakes um, and would benefit more from, from having folks there. But uh, it is, uh, I guess, the approach I was inherited and you know, probably the onus is on me for not spending more time on it. Fair enough. Okay, let's try. Do we have anyone from the audience who would like to ask an uncomfortable question of one of us? <laughs> The question would be for Mike. Yep. Um, so from what you just talked about, basically, uh, my question would be if you guys are doing those sort of studies and playtests with, you know, various members of the dev team and the designers and stuff, how do you work with, you know, maybe some of the bias that could, you know, result from that? Like, you know, sometimes, you know, on our side, at a, where I work at least, uh, you know, we often, you know, make sure that the participants you know, and the people understand that we don't work directly with what they're going to be, you know, trying and playing and stuff. So how do you work with that? <laughs> yeah, so, so a bunch of the people who are, you know, essentially running playtest right are people who've been, you know, at Valve for 16 years, 18 years, 20 years. So they, they've been running playtests for a while. And so, you know, they figured some stuff out on their own and other stuff, you know, they didn't. And then when I got there, if I was helpful, like I would point things out too. Um, so, uh, it, obviously, it's you know nowhere close to to a perfect situation, but they're a lot better than kind of complete novices, I guess, at, at the task because they've done it so much. Um, so you know, like the more ways you can contribute at Valve, like the more valuable you are, right? It's just at any company, right? And so, if you become good at kind of running playtests and gathering data and acquire skill over years, right? Like in some, in some cases, decades, right? Then um, you know. Ideally, that the data will be better than if we were kind of just handing it over to complete novices. And then you kind of, as new people come on the team, you know, you let them know that, yeah, this is the way we make games, right? Like, it's really important to be involved in the playtest. And then they can, you know, talk to people who've done it for a while, or they can come talk to me, right? Or, you know, if need be, like, you know, I, I can run the playtest or design things myself. So, okay. Do one more? Nope. Follow up question to you, Mike. Oh, I, I think they want us to use, yeah, use the mic for the streamers. Um, Follow-up question again on same topic. Yep. Um, we talk about the dev side of things, but what about the users? How skewed they could be to not give them, to give you your um, the data you want because they don't want to tell you your game sucks or your product is yeah. uh, suboptimal. Uh, sub like, how do you think that affects things that you talk to the creators directly? Yeah, so like, it absolutely does. Um, so, so sometimes, uh, well, most, uh, almost all the time, we just try and hide that fact. And if they, you know, if they figure it out, then we, as, as with any exercise, you know, we, we try and account for the biases that are present. Um, so yeah, it's never, I mean, they know they're coming to Valve, which sucks because uh, they bring in preconceived biases. Um, you know, if it's a game they haven't seen, but they can guess what it is, then that sucks too, because they bring in preconceived biases. And if they think they're talking to the dev team, then that also sucks, because they bring in preconceived biases. And so um, we try to limit as much of that as we can, um, sometimes we do like anonymous testing, and um, yeah, we never volunteer who we are, 
um, just, you know, folks who are interested in, in gathering data. Um, but yeah, like it's absolutely a concern and would be an argument in favor of having, you know, folks who said, yeah, like who can s state honestly, right? Like I'm, I'm not, you know, a developer, so you can be more honest with me. Um, and also, some people are, are better or worse, right, at kind of getting, putting people at ease and trying to convey, like, the utility of truly honest feedback. Um, like, that is, um, you know, some, you know, I imagine I'm okay at conveying that message. Um, I, I, I hope that some of the others are as well. Thank you. Yep. We do one more, I think. Actually, we do a couple more. <laughs> These are better questions. Okay. Um, asking, since I know a little bit of information from how you guys feel about this, but I think it's a good discussion topic. As two people who came out of academia, what do you think the value is or is not of going for a higher education degree and being in games user research? Yeah, that's a good question. Do you want to start? Sure. I mean, I use everything I was taught in my psychology PhD except for the actual psychology parts. I use all of the sort of method stuff. I use all the writing stuff. I use all the statistics. All that kind of stuff I use every day. Um, the actual degree I only use when someone is being pompous and I need to be pompous back. <laughs> and I use it, I pull it out to sort of club people who uh, need clubbing. And that's, but that's pretty much it. I don't, the actual sort of uh, degree is less valuable to me now, at this, especially at this point in my career, than the years I've spent actually working on games. So I have a slightly different perspective, Dr. Hobson. Um, <laughs> was, uh, um, although I, I think we, I think we, we agree on, on some of the stuff. Um, so I, so yeah, I use everything I learned in my, my PhD, including the psychology knowledge. In fact, like that was a point I was going to bring up first, right? Is that I, like, I, I wish I knew more from psychology. Like I, I, I find, uh, uh, yeah, there's a large amount of opportunity to apply knowledge about how humans behave and the influences on behavior. Um, and to apply it to questions of interest in, in game design, and I wish I knew more of it, right? Because I'm, I'm always constantly looking, looking things up. But um, like, as John alluded to, like, yeah, the experimental design methodology, like getting expertise in that, like stats, obviously, um, like having familiarity with the broad array of research methods, um, like essentially learning how to do science and, and be a scientist, right? And like actually like both create and, and apply knowledge um, is incredibly important. I don't think it's necessary um, like for somebody to go into academia or get an advanced degree to get into the field. Um, like when people ask me that question, I say like the, the advice I give them is um, like don't ever do it as a means to an end, right? Like if you're generally interested in you know, what you're studying, then fantastic, go and do it. Um, because th the best way I know of to get good at something is to actually enjoy like the time you're spending. And so if you don't enjoy school, like don't be in grad school. Um, if you do, then great, like you will get better at it because you're enjoying the process. And so um, if you, you, know, you want to do research and, and you know, get a master's or a PhD, great. Um, if you want to get started and start doing games research, that's great too. And even while you're in grad school, you can still be doing you know, stuff you'd be doing in industry, right? Like there's nothing stopping anybody from you know, doing their own research studies, whether it's as part of their program or on their own. Um, but uh, if you get the degree, be prepared to jettison a lot of it in that transition. Like, I cannot think of a worse tool for convincing an industry stakeholder than an academic research paper. Like that is an, that format is actively hostile to yeah. anyone who isn't yeah. trained I, in it. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it is a skill to be like, okay, th this is something that, you know, is a consistent, you know, measurement of behavior, right? And this is why it's useful to us, right? And yeah, like holding up a, a journal article is not going to do it, right? But if you can walk somebody through the rationale for what the paper is saying, then if you have to walk them through the rationale, You've already lost. <laughs> about the war <laughs> Maybe failed. I work with like more open-minded <laughs> people. I don't know. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess you know it probably depends on, on who your audience is. But um, yeah, like I, I, I don't think I've encountered as much resistance as I guess as you have. But that's yeah. I mean, we work different places, and, and that's the way it goes. Okay. Cool. Do we have another question? Um, yeah, speaking of academia in psychology, experimental psychology, there are all these ethical safeguards, right? Nobody wants six these kinds of experimental psychology anymore. <laughs> Do you think games user research needs these kinds of ethical gay, gay safeguards as well, especially when it's applied to monetization topics? Let's think of random monetization topics like loot boxes or something, right? Do you think as games user researchers we need to uh, protect the experiments we do from being misused by the people that are in business? Or do we? what kind of ethical uh, guidelines maybe should we adopt in, in, t in that? In a similar to a psychological academia. Yeah. So I, I think it's really hard to prevent people from from misusing research. Um, like I like I, I like I, I don't have like a satisfying answer 
to that, right? Like I think, um, yeah, you know, there are things that we are researching because we find them interesting and we think it's going to lead to increased customer happiness and on some axis and in some domain. And we're like, great, that's awesome. Um, and then people will, will twist it around. Right? I mean, there's a lot of research in basic psychology, right? That people are using to, you know, using nefariously, right? Um, uh, so like, like my like personal philosophy in a vacuum, right, is that more knowledge is good because then we can make smarter decisions. But like that's kind of like naive in some respects to think that you know it's not going to lead to kind of like negative outcomes for folks. And so, um, I think people kind of blindly applying research would be bad, right? Or not actually do, doing as you're asking, right? It's like thinking through the consequences of like how could this be misused and like you know is it worth it, right? Because like that is a trade off and a consideration, right? And if we're like, well, actually, yeah, we don't gain that much, but like the downside is high, then yeah, like we shouldn't be doing it. Like I think that's. I think However, reasonable. I don't think we should go as far as academia has. Like when I go to an academic conference and present and I tell them I don't have an institutional review board, they are incredibly jealous. <laughs> they, they're, they're like, what? Yeah. You just get to do whatever? It's like, yeah. yes. I mean, yeah. with the consent of uh, our community liaisons and our lawyers, yeah. yes. We have yeah. really broad sort of uh, boundaries. Yeah. Um, and I don't think we should go all the way to where the IRB end of things, but we probably do need some basic guidelines. I think most of us have them already, but we should probably formalize them a little more than we have. Yeah, and I, I think, I guess one other like check and balance, right? It's like the community event, like it takes time, right? But they do hold people accountable, right? And so like if there are, yeah, things that people find objectionable, right? Like that takes a long time sometimes, but it, it does kind of, it does happen, so. So on the note of the ethical guidelines, um, so do you think that an um, academic background is actually valuable in that sense, that you have that um, ethical ed education that you might not otherwise get if you just go straight into industry? Yes, <laughs> especially because, I mean, a lot of the academic stuff is things like, how do you protect the participants from themselves? Like, they won't quit voluntarily. And I've run playtests that are, like, all weekend playtests where they're playing, like, eight hours on Saturday and eight hours on Sunday. It's like... Well, should I have done that? Maybe, probably not. <laughs> like, that was probably a little intense. Um, but our players are fans. They will sign up for things that they shouldn't. And having that little extra voice in my head that tells me to protect them from themselves is useful. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Like, I think, like, it, it's a necessary component of doing research in, in academia, right? It's like, it, it's constantly hammered in, right? Just like how careful and how protective of, of you know, users and, and subjects and players you need to be. Um, so, yeah, I would, yeah, wholeheartedly agree. Okay, so let's do one more of that film in the back who's been patient. <laughs> and then we'll ask ourselves some questions. Hi, guys. Um, so I know that we take a basic scientific approach or a scientific approach, if you will, to what we do. No? Okay, fine. Um, do you ever feel, I mean, this is a question for both of you. Do you ever feel that sometimes that because we try to control as many variables as we can, that we maybe step on our own feet, we get in our own way, maybe we don't take as many risks as we, as we should with the studies that we run? Um, I'm not going to talk about my experience, but I'm curious about yours. Yeah. Well, so, so that is what I was uh, alluding to uh, somewhat, I guess, in an in, in earlier question. Um, yeah, so like that was a big change for me coming from academia where like, yeah, like the goal is to be as clean as possible and in industry and, you know, in, with games, you can't, right? Like they're a variety of questions. And so once, I guess, you know, if you have that aversion, as I did, once you get over that, then I, I think it becomes, um, you know, if you can internalize why you're doing certain things and, you know, why money was playing, you know, an issue here and keeping, you know, um, you know, the experiment clean is, is not kind of a priority because you're going to make customers unhappy, right? Then you, you start, um, you, you do start kind of, I guess, changing the way you design experiments. And I mean, you know, I, I don't know if I'm you know, qualified to objectively assess like the level of risk I'm taking in like the experiments I'm designing. So like, I think your point is valid and maybe I hold back in various things because I'm trying to like, well, it's going to be noisy. And so I don't like that. But um, to the extent that I can like kind of overcome that, like, you know, aversion and, you know, say, hey, like, I mean, I, I, I like to like when whatever we do, whatever study or experiment or whatever we're doing, I like to look at it and be like, okay, like, what are the possible sources of bias? And like, be aware of them, right? But then just, you know, go forward. It's like, hey, like, this could be shading the results this way, right? And like, and as long as you, if you do that exercise, right, like, you get, you become a better user researcher. And so um, it, it ends up being kind of, um, so I don't know how risky I'm being, but I like to think that at least I'm trying to assess the risks and then acknowledging them and then still moving forward, I guess. I've gotten to take, I think, more risks, actually, uh, especially because I let a lot of my research be driven by my conversation with the dev development team. And they always come to me with questions that, like, I've never thought of and which don't fit in because they don't know what the methods are and they don't, their questions don't always fit in those boxes. 
and therefore I'm willing to go outside of my boxes to get them the answers. I mean, the nice thing about the boxes is they're sort of pre-cut and you can just sort of stamp them out and they're much less effort, but they don't always get the answers the team needs. And so if you're focused on their needs, it will pull you outside of that comfort zone pretty often. Thank you. Okay, so uh, ask yourself some questions more? Sure. Couple? Okay. So the one I got for you yep. is I've now been at four different game companies yep. in my, the past 15 years. You've been at one yes. this entire time. Now, do you think that's that you would have learned more about being a researcher if you moved around to other companies, perhaps ones that actually ship games? <laughs> <laughs> I will take a deep breath <laughs> and then respond. Okay. Um, okay, so the, the short answer is um, would I have learned more? Yes. I, I, think, I think that's, that's probably fair. Um, like the, the longer answer is um, like I really like where I am, and I really like the things I get to do, and I get to work on different games and work on different projects, and the variety is not as large as it would be if had I kind of you know, worked at a few different places and you know the diversity of experience would have been, you know, broader and I would have, you know, talked to more people who are doing various things and, and learned more. Um, so I, yeah, I probably, yeah. So I would be, I would have, yeah, I, I, I would be probably a better user researcher had I worked more places, but I don't know if I'd be happier. Um, like I, yeah, like I, I stay at Valve because I really like the work that I do and I really like the company. And so, um, yeah, like I, like, so, so to me, yeah, so like I, I'd be a better user researcher, but just, yeah, like, not, uh, you know, less happy person, I think. Um, Probably a good answer. Yep. Okay, so then yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. turn the question around, like, on you, yeah. right? Okay, so what, <laughs> what, have you, what have you learned or acquired, or like, how has, like, working at a variety of places, like, benefited you as a user researcher? I mean, I think the main thing that's driven into me is that just how context dependent it is what we're doing. That, like, I've done things that worked at one company, didn't work at the next, and worked again at the third. And it's just that we tend to think that we're doing science. We're doing something that is objective and works regardless of who's observing it and the sort of the context around it. And that's just not true. That like the nature of the team, the nature of the game, the nature of all these other weird little factors make a huge difference in the success and failure of our research projects. And it, it's driven me towards a much more sort of a holistic and less sort of doctrinaire approach to the job. And that's why I'm more comfortable with a less scientific approach is that I just know that that there's a lot of other factors that are mattering besides the purity of my methods. Okay. Okay, so the question I have for uh -oh. you. So uh, as John alluded to, uh, like I guess it was six years ago, I thought it was longer. Maybe we're <laughs> not as old as we think we are. Um, John and I, yeah, we had uh, kind of a debate, and like the, the theme of the debate was we're going to each pick a user research method, like think aloud or direct observation or metrics or biometrics, um, and we're going to defend it and debate it and hopefully be interesting for folks. And so we called it Beyond Thunderdome, and it was great. Um, uh, so we each had like four topics that we were like a pro in favor of, or at least arguing, and you know, that was all. Oh, so awesome. And at the end, we're like, you know what? We want to end on a positive note, on an agreeable note. So we're going to pick a method we both agree sucks. And that methodology was focus groups. Um, <laughs> we're like, we, 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 we were like, we talked about it. And we're like, yeah, we're going to like say like, hey, guys, you know, people suck at reasoning in the abstract and you can make anything sound good. And it's just not useful. And they just kind of go off in the weeds. And yeah, I mean, you know. Really straightforward, honest, simplistic, basic, mm -hmm. easy to understand reasons why focus groups suck. And so it has come to my attention, John, that <laughs> in the time <laughs> since the talk, you have done a few focus groups. And so I would like to know what has changed. Uh, <laughs> or why they it, no longer It is suck. true. I have sinned. Um. <laughs> so... The uh, thing that really I found useful about focus groups is as an initial exploratory method of like, I'm interested in this group of players, let's get a bunch of them in a room and just talk to them. There's nothing wrong with that as, a, I mean, what you can get out, you can get some truth out of there. The tricky part is that it is sort of user research without any of the safeguards that we use in our normal methods, that we spend a lot of time, a lot of the, sorry, a lot of the processes we have around our research and our methods are to protect the data from ourselves and to protect ourselves from overinterpreting and projecting our own opinions in. And focus groups are such a raw, squishy method that it is, it's like working without sort of the radiation shielding on. 
However, in a bunch of cases, it's been really useful. Uh, example I did was for one of my games, uh, pulling in all the most reported players in the local area. And it's like, okay, here's everyone who's getting reported for toxicity. Let's get them in a room and talk to them. And find out, and say, like, what, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and it was a great place for coming up with a whole bunch of ideas, of a bunch of things to, to investigate using real methods later. You don't take any hard conclusions away from the focus group, but it is a place to start. And so it's a great, and it is so cheap and so easy. Like, there's no technical setup. There's no sort of room prep. You just sort of throw them in a conference room and sit down. And that ease of use is, makes it a really sort of, it has a place in the toolbox, I admit it. So, well, I, I, like, that is, I guess, a somewhat reasonable answer. Um, <laughs> uh, no, so, it, I mean, it, it sounds like you're describing a form of, of data collection, mm -hmm. and, and that's fine. I, I guess, I think, back in the day, I think the, the form of focus groups we were talking about is we're going to describe a hypothetical title. Maybe it has a three at the end of it. Who knows? Um, and <laughs> you don't uh, make any of those. Uh, and so, oh. uh, you know, and then you, you describe, say, hey, does this sound appealing to you, right? It's the, the, kinds of, like, the kinds of leading questions, right, that lead to messy and noisy data and that people can always give kind of guided responses to, right, which seems to be a problem, which may or may not be the case in the kinds of discussions you're leading. I but guess that's I not a, a, a property of focus groups. You could ask those bad questions in a usability study. Yes. You could ask them in a play test. Uh, you, just, you still have to be a good researcher. I mean, the hardest part actually of running the focus groups for me was keeping the team from running amok of taking things they heard and running off the rails. And so there was actually a lot more stakeholder management in running a good, stake, a good focus group than running a good usability or play test. But if you're willing to take on the burden, it is a one way of getting data and something I've found useful in certain cases. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. I think let's go back to the audience. We only have a couple minutes left here. Do we have more questions? Uh-oh, James. <laughs> Oh, it's a very softball. <laughs> yeah. Test. All right. Softball for once. Okay. Um, so you guys have been doing this a really long time, not to make you feel old, but what would you wish you learned or what wish, what is it something you know now that you wish you knew when you were just beginning your journey? Like a lot of the people here, they're getting at the start of their journey. What do you wish that, that you could have known at the beginning? Uh, how little of the job is about being right. <laughs> is that I, again, coming out of academia, it was about coming up with the right answer and coming up with a provably right answer. And that is like the least important factor in running a successful research study most of the time. I mean, the answer does have to be right. It has to be provably right. But in terms of what actually sort of moves the de development team to actually fix the problem, that's almost a non-factor. And if I'd, I wish I'd realized how important everything else was beforehand. Yeah. So... Uh I get yeah. So again, I guess you know my experiences differ uh, somewhat from John's. Uh, at least for me, it, it was kind of like how quickly uh, things would go. Um, I had yeah, in academia, you know, you can take years and work on a research project, and then you can come up with an answer you think is useful and you share it with folks. Um, and here, like again, I, I think you know at least in my experience, like accuracy has has been important, like and, and need to justify why, why it's happening. But things happen so quickly, and so um, I wish I knew how how quickly things would go and how quickly I would need to like think and like do research and do analysis and design an experiment and go and be like, okay, you know, like, Hey, we want to, we have an idea for a thing and it's going to go out Thursday. So like, you know, is it a good idea? Um, so, uh, yeah. So, so for me, it, it was kind of just, uh, understanding how dramatically the pace had increased from, uh, from academia. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh. Oh. Sorry, excuse me. You also have 10 minutes left. Okay. I wanted to ask about the focus group that you were talking about. Yes. With all the to all the most toxic players in the local community. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I they did could probably secure. be summarized by just saying like, how did that go? Uh, uh. <laughs> they were actually way nicer than I thought they would be. Uh, I I was uh, admit. I chickened out a little bit and I warned security and made sure they had somebody uh, outside in the building. 
but they were all like perfectly nice people that you would be happy to have on your team, uh, except for the toxicity part. But, yeah. And the main thing I took away from it that is how much they always thought that they weren't the one who started it. It was not that I went toxic and called you names. It was that you ruined my game by playing Hanzo. That's like, <laughs> you, it, it, they never thought they started the fight. It was always the other person. Is you let me down, and therefore I am justified in starting to spew uh, racist epithets on top of on the voice channel. <laughs> no, Was it, uh, did I see one over here? No. We we'll go back to talking to ourselves. Oh, sorry, the gentleman in the front row. Nope. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> You'd like a boom mic. Okay. Oh, nice. uh, going back to the question you mentioned about uh, grad school, where you both seem to imply that some of the skills you got was really good, but degree didn't really help that much. Um, I'm wondering if that's still applicable now, because from what I've been seeing, there's been like seven junior researcher positions open in the past eight months. And from positions that I know of, because I'm really tightly involved in the community, or like I try to be, I know like Becky Grady, Jessica Tompkins, Ian Anderson, they all have graduate degrees and gotten like internships at like place, uh, PlayStation and other places. I know that I was only fortunate enough to get an internship because I got a master's degree under Catherine Isbister. Um, a lot of these details seem to be skewed heavily towards people with graduate degrees ending up with internships and jobs and not as much with undergraduates. I, I know think, a few undergraduates I, who I did. think there's a confounding factor, which is a lot of the people who are getting, as you, as you said, the people who are passionate about are the ones going for the graduate degrees who have a little extra hustle. Uh, I think that's probably the confounding factor. I mean, I've personally hired about half and half PhDs and non-PhDs. Yeah, I guess like uh, my honest sense, like I, I guess I, I don't know. Like I, like th there's no reason a priori not to hire somebody out of an undergrad position. Like you know, you just if you go to grad school, there's certain expectations about the skills you might acquire, and so that might scope like kind of where they begin and what you trust them with. Um, but to the extent that you know, it, I don't like, I have a PhD. I don't think it's necessary to have a PhD or a master's degree. Um, you know, and like I, I would. You know, we obviously don't hire very often, but uh, I would not um, like look askance at somebody who was like, hey, I'm good and this is how I'm good. And like they could show me however they wanted, whether it was a degree or not. So. so in terms of uh, product development, what would you say was your biggest mess up at any of any of your projects? And how did you kind of uh, come back from that? Huge mistake. So my biggest mess up, uh, and I will say our biggest mess up, because Randy was there for this one. Uh, it was a full, <laughs> a full participant in this one, was the Halo 2 matchmaking system, where we put, where we put in front of participants and said, would you like us to build this? And they said, no. Because they said, what do you mean I don't get to pick a lobby that has the map I want and the game type I want? What do you mean that you're just going to matchmake me with random assholes and, uh, and on a game type I don't agree with? And they, they hated it. And we went to the team and said, your players hate this. And they said, we're doing it anyway. And they were absolutely right to do that. And, we, and the thing is, we had strayed into one of the classic mistakes of we asked people the hypothetical of, would you like this? And we, hadn't we, we sort of snuck up on it and didn't realize when we crossed the line. But we, we strayed into asking people to make a f judgment about the, how they would feel in the future. And that was bad. And we were justly punished. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I was writing SQL code for uh, a TF2 item grant, and I think I was writing code to you know, selecting people who had met some criteria, and I think I was, there was like 100,000 of them, and I was like, okay, if people meet this criteria, we're going to grant you this item. Uh, so my, my SQL code did the opposite and gave everybody who wasn't a member of that 100,000 uh, <laughs> the item. So, uh, I mean, it, you know, like, you know, that it, it happened. Uh, and so, I mean, it, it was fixable, like, the... the, the Code wasn't really a problem, but like once it started like happening, you know, there's like an hour or two or a day of like, holy shit. <laughs> like, um, but uh, you know, like it was, you know, it, it, the fix actually ended up not being that bad. But it was, you know, definitely a mistake or a reminder to uh, like you know triple and quadruple check your oh. your SQL. My other favorite one uh, to give another actual practical tip was I forgot to put a quota on one of my surveys, and so it was a it was with a survey tool that charged per response. So I actually, I accidentally got sort of 
tens of thousands of responses more than I intended mm -hmm. and cost the company about like $10,000 like nice. on the spot. So always, always put a, put a max quota <laughs> to limit your liability. Uh, the lady in red again. Uh, hi, yeah, two, two things. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to go back real quick to the question of the uh, sir in the front that I don't know who it was talking but uh, about the the degrees and you know how it may you know uh, put some uh, some uh, some trouble into maybe getting an internship or a job uh, I just want to say that it's definitely I definitely agree with the hustle part you know I don't have an impressive degree I worked in years uh, you know as a coordinator for QA before getting in user research and obviously you know I entered as a junior researcher you know which may sound like a, a step down you know to what I was doing before or whatever but you know for me you know, that was just, uh, you know, an upgrade into my own, you know, uh, interest and my own happiness. So that, you know, for me, that's that's what happened, you know. So definitely, you know, sometimes, you know, you have to kind of work a bit more, you know, from the from the bottom up. Um, but it's definitely uh, possible. But my actual question is, uh, so sometimes, and that's something that we've talked about on our side sometimes, is that because, you know, when we go into just a normal playtest, let's say, um, It'll happen sometimes where you know the the, the surveys or like the the the, uh, the things we're trying to do get very deep, and the surveys get longer, and the data gets very intense and dense, and uh, then sometimes we and that's something we've noticed is that we tend to s occasionally lose the big picture mm -hmm. and lose ourselves in that. So what I wanted to know, and that's a question for both of you, was there any moments in your career where you maybe went too far um, and kind of like wasted maybe energy or you know resources on things? that maybe would have been maybe a, a, you could have approached better uh, and more with an open uh, an open mind and less you know in the nitty-gritty stuff like uh, for 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 your, your your study if that makes sense <laughs> uh, yes okay so um, yeah I mean I, I think that and I think that happens like to this day um, I, I guess one I guess concrete examples when we were I guess first designing in-game economies for, for TF2 and Dota, we spent an awful lot of time in the weeds um, trying to figure things out because we were very worried about making irreversible mistakes. Like lots of game designs, you know, you can ship an update and then you can kind of call back um, with in-game items and, and various things, which was a new territory for us. Um, it was a lot scarier because it seemed like some of the mistakes were irreversible. And so we spent an awful lot of time, uh, yeah, kind of, I, I guess, drilling deep into like the mechanics of various things and how they may or may not kind of align with world economies, and I, I think that was useful, but I think we also kind of overthought stuff and that I think paralyzed us to, um, prevented us from experimenting uh, as much as we should have and probably would have wanted to. I mean, personally, I've had a couple of products that I've just clubbed to death with the sheer number of participants I ran. Uh, I think Halo 3, we ran just under 1,000. Destiny, we ran like 1,500. And that's like over, that's over years, but still like, uh, there's a there's a line from uh, marketing that like half of my marketing dollars are wasted. I just don't know which half, and I I've made that mistake a lot on my on my studies. I've a lot, run a lot of studies I didn't have to, but which is one of the reasons why I now sort of self compensate by making sure my methods are as cheap and as fast as possible, yeah. so I can run more studies and do throwaways in a way and not have to worry quite as much about the cost of them. Okay, I think we are almost out of time, but can we I, do, oh. oh, so yeah, like, well, oh. yeah. If you guys have a question, you can ask. If not, I'll ask John a question. Uh-oh. Yeah. Please save me from Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask you afterwards. I like you all much more. Yeah, yeah. I think you're okay. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. So I understood your comment as um, people with advanced degrees have more hustle. <laughs> I would like you to defend that comment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's defensible, um, but I think they definitely show more interest in the field. Like they're putting in the effort in to that thing they're studying. Getting a PhD or a master's is hard, and that's they've shown a certain amount of desire and work ethic and a bunch of other stuff. You can show that without doing that degree, but it is a nice sort of convenient marker for a bunch of things. Good, good save. <laughs> Dodge. Okay. We have oh, how much time do we have? We are at five fifteen. Yeah, we're done. We're, oh, we're done. Okay. Well thank you very much guys. Yep. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you.